everybody. Welcome to the Retro Wrestling Review Podcast, where we watch and review old school retro pro wrestling. First project will be USWA Championship Wrestling from 1993. I'm your host, Gene Jackson, and I want to welcome my esteemed co-host. You may know him from P3 Radio, Richard Mulliken and Josh Briley. Guys, how are you doing today? Hey, doing great. This is weird being on video. I'm trying not to look at myself. <laughs> yeah, and... and <laughs> Everybody will see me reading the uh, the format here, so that's kind of weird all the way around. But we're trying something new, uh, <laughs> you know, as far as how we're doing this. You know, old yeah. school wrestling is not new to any of us. You know, I just want to say on the front end here, you know, we're all wrestling fans, especially Memphis wrestling fans. Um, you know, you guys, if, uh, if you want to, before we get started, just for a little bit of context here to kind of give uh, – your connection, uh, both of you guys to, uh, Memphis wrestling or kind of describe your fandom to the people kind of let people know where you're coming from here. Yep. So, uh, I grew up with professional wrestling on every Saturday. Um, you know, we would watch Memphis, we would watch everything to the point where, um, uh, I got into the business, you know, when I got old enough to wrestle. So 18 years old, uh, I was in the uh, crew of guys that was on the CW 30 with Memphis wrestling. Uh, so met a lot of guys there. So, a lot of these people were also in my life because of Josh, uh, who Josh can tell his his side of the story. But we were pretty much raised with Memphis wrestling, like kind of in our DNA. Um, yeah, man. Um, so my uncle is Nightmare Danny Davis. And so a lot of times, you know, I grew up a lot like Richard was my grandmother's neighbor. So, <laughs> you know, a lot of times my uncle, he would come because we live in Jackson, Tennessee, which is the midway point between memphis and nashville so a lot of times he would stop in you know on the road or whatever and cody michaels might be with him or joey mags might be with him or just name whoever and they might be with him or and uh, my granny she uh made gear for a lot of guys so always having wrestlers over and stuff always wrestling always Playing wrestling, yeah. you know, it's just, it's always been there. It was always cool to look over across the street and see, like, talking to my grandmother. I'm like, that's Jeff Jarrett. Jeff Jarrett just got out of that car. You know, that's, that's Honky Tonk Man. What's Honky Tonk Man doing over there? And then she would make us tights. Like, we have pictures of, like, us when we were running around, like, our neighborhood looking like crazy people in, like, masks. lime green masks and tights. <laughs> and Josh is like, these were made for uh, Eric Embry. And it's like a... He didn't like them, so he didn't we got like them now. So, <laughs> so he's wearing, like, the low-cut, like, boxer brief, like, singlets just out yeah. in the middle of Bemis, you know, in a little subdivision. So, uh, but it was really cool. Like I said, it was like we were just ingrained into Memphis wrestling just because of Mr. Uncle Danny, right? Uh, as we call him on P3 Radio, <laughs> Mr. Uncle Danny. Uh, but we'd go through all of his crap. Like we'd find, like we go through his closet. At one point, I brought the global light heavyweight title <laughs> over to Richard's house, and we had a nice. fucking match for yeah, it. It was, yeah, it was really cool. So yeah, wrestling's just been a part of our lives all through our whole lives. So that's awesome. I mean, I was uh, so as a kid, I was a huge fan of the nightmares, like in Continental and in Memphis, but mostly in Continentals. That's where I, I was able to go see them, like in Columbus, Mississippi. So I was a huge nightmare danny davis fan <clears throat> so once i found out that you know josh was his nephew i was I, I've, I've been a big mark for that ever since i've heard that so maybe who knows maybe at some point you might can uh once we get this thing going and show people we're serious about it maybe you can uh twist his arm and get him to make an appearance on here or something i'll or try my damn yeah. awesome. in or something, something he's, he's loving florida though he's loving relaxing and stuff <laughs> but uh that's cool man i'm glad to have you guys were the the first guys i thought of uh you know, when we decided to do this. And so uh, I immediately reached out and I was tickled when you guys agreed to do it. So uh, we're going to get started here. But, you know, so today's episode, we're going to be talking about the January 2nd, 1993 episode of USWA. But I feel like to properly do that for context, we got to kind of take a step back and talk about the December 26th, 1992 episode of USWA. So we're not going to spend a lot of time on this. We're going to just run through the, uh, the gist of what took place. So on that episode, we saw Madman Pondo. Yes, that Madman Pondo, uh, for people who know he, the, the hardcore <laughs> wrestler. Uh, he went down to USWA Southern champion Jeff Jarrett in a non-title match. Uh, we saw the tag team of Mr. Clyde and Mr. Paradise face the team of superstar Bill Nundee and Nightmare Danny Davis. 
And I think you can all guess how that played out. Uh, and then we saw <laughs> the famous creature with Burt Prentice get the best of Ricky Hayes. And then in promo wise, uh, we, saw, we saw a long segment where Brian Christopher offers up other people's hair. Uh, managers who he referred to as, as valets at the time, even though they were all male. Uh, first, Brian offered up Burt Prentice's hair against Jeff Jarrett's USWA Southern title. Uh, Burt refused, and ultimately he decided to separate himself from Brian, and he left. So Brian then put up Mike Sample's hair against Jeff Jarrett's USWA Southern title, and eventually Mike Sample's quit. So then Brian offered up Mr. Clyde, who was an enhancement guy there for the USWA. And some of these people we're going to go back and talk about a little more in depth later on as we go through the series here. Uh, but today's show could be a little long since we're kind of sort of talking about two shows. So we're not going to dig too deep. Uh, but Mr. Clyde declined as well. So finally we landed on Zeke Rivers was the lucky <laughs> fellow who got his hair on the line uh, against – Brian Christopher, I mean, against Jeff Jarrett's title on behalf of Brian Christopher. And we'll have a little more of that on later in the episode. Uh, then uh, Burt Prentice has come out and continued to push his narrative at the time that Miss Texas was not really a woman. She was actually a man named Bubba Johnson, of all things. <laughs> and over the course of these podcasts, uh, we'll encounter quite a few of these angles that probably wouldn't fly in 2024. Uh, this being a, a a prime example of that, but uh, we'll talk about those later on. And then uh, Nightmare Danny Davis, who uh, got a face full of ether earlier in the program from the Masters of Terror, uh, comes out with Bill Dundee and demands a tag team match with a crazy stipulation that apparently he saw it at some point, but uh, he hasn't actually been in one or seen it. He just knows it's called something like an Oriental death match, he said. Uh, he, spends a, <laughs> he spends a couple of minutes describing it. Uh, we'll wait till we end up covering 1992 at some point to really get into what those stipulations were, but it sounded pretty wild. But it was something like an <laughs> Oriental death match, according to Uncle Danny. Uh, <laughs> and then uh, after a painful segment that saw Richard Lee playing guitar and singing along to a song with Moondog Spot, uh, they bring out all the participants for the Moondog Battle Royal that's going to be coming up that Monday night. They all come out and draw their numbers, so apparently this was going to be a Moondog Rumble more than just a Moondog Battle Royal. And then Lawler comes out with a fireworks assortment from Fireworks City that will be given away on Monday night since we're right there at New Year's. He then does a promo for Monday night, letting everyone know the winner of the Moondog Battle Royal will get $10,000. He also plugs his world title versus mask match that he's going to have against the Christmas creature, who he teases and insinuates is someone from the WWF. Uh, <laughs> well, uh, the week prior to this, he had flat out said that it was Sid from uh, WWF. It wasn't. Uh, and then in the main event of the program, the Bruise Brothers, Ron and Don Harris with Burt Prentice, took on uh, USWA Southern champion Jeff Jarrett and his partner, the unified world champion Jerry the King Lawler, in a match that shockingly ended in a disqualification, guys, <laughs> when Brian Christopher and the Christmas Creature ran in. And eventually, we also saw the Moondogs come in, Dundee and Davis, the Masters of Terror, et cetera, et cetera. And the show ended in turmoil leading in to that Monday's card. Uh, any comments y'all want to make on, on that episode from anything you heard there? I don't know if you saw it, but you said Christmas creature and I did this right here and came back down. <laughs> um, man, I, I just, I, I listening back to this, you know, I was always, you know, we were always too poor to get to Memphis to see any of these, but watching these shows back, like it, it just dawned on me, like how much I wanted to just go every week. It didn't matter who was there, or who was, who was involved. I just wanted to be there, uh, but never could get there. Uh, and then just listening back to some of these names like Mr. Clyde and the masters of terror. It's like, those guys are smart. They have a master's degree in terror. Um, <laughs> like in Mr. Clyde, like, like some of these names that I hadn't thought about in years. Um, he you, looked good. Though. He, he looked, was a big guy. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, it's like Mr. Clyde was his name. It's almost like he runs a daycare, you know? Um, like, I mean, I just Mr. think Clyde? about the fact that there, you know, would, I got involved in wrestling in like 97 and spent a few years. I remember that I labored over what my name was going to be for weeks and months. Right. And yeah. just, I mean, 
back and forth and back and forth and talking to friends. And then it's like, how long do you think it took him to come up with Mr. Clyde? Like, <laughs> and that's what we landed on. So what right. were the losers of that uh, <laughs> <Right>. contest? <laughs> Had to be some stinkers. But I think what I was getting at there was just the fact that even though the, some of the names now as we're older seem a little like cheesy, I mean, back then you couldn't have told me these guys weren't like the best in the world. Um, oh, yeah. and, and it's still like, it's a nostalgia feel when you read off some of those, those names and some of those, uh, matches, like where I was and how I felt about them as a kid. Like it was just awesome. It was, it was but awesome. You, to see. You, you think about it though. A lot of times, at least me and I know you specifically, but you'd have those arguments at school about wrestling's fake, wrestling's fake. And at that point in time, I'm 11, I'm still in it. I'm like, no, it's not. They're really hitting each other. They're right. really hurting each other. And then you have to defend the Christmas creature. <laughs> right. You know what I mean? Right. It's, it, it's, yeah. a, it's a hard battle. Yeah. But I, I still, I loved it so much as a kid. And that added a lot of uh, color to the black and white. You know what I mean? Yeah. Exactly. And we're going to come back to the Christmas creature here in a moment. Because right now, <laughs> we're going to head over to the Coliseum. This is what went down on December 28th, 1992 at the Mid-South Coliseum. They drew 3,500 people for this card. Wow. Remember that number. It'll, it'll yeah. be important later on. In the opening match, we saw Burt Prentice and Leslie Ballinger beat Miss Texas and Eddie Marlin. What a tag team <laughs> match that must have been. <laughs> then, in the second match, we saw Bill Dundee and Danny Davis beat the Masters of Terror in an Oriental death match. Uh, third match on the card saw the USWA Southern Heavyweight Champion Jeff Jarrett pin Brian Christopher in a title versus Zeke Rivers hair match, resulting in Brian's manager Zeke Rivers having his head shaved. And we'll see a little bit of that later in this program. Then the Bruise Brothers, Ron and Don Harris, beat the Moondog Spot and Spike to win the USWA Tag Team Championships. And then in the main event, the USWA Unified World Champ, Jerry the King Lawler, pinned the Christmas Creature. And, of course, the Christmas Creature was revealed to be Glenn Jacobs, a.k.a. Kane. Although it was said many of the fans uh, had presumed that the Christmas Creature was Brian Lee. And uh, Lawler, who had also insinuated it was Sid. However, when the Creature was unmasked, most people didn't even get a good look at Jacobs because he got out of there. So most people left there that night having no idea <laughs> that Christmas Creature was the future Isaac Yankum. And even further in the future, <laughs> Kane, Doomsday, take your pick. Uh, but looking back from, uh, you know, 2024, if, if you came back in a time machine and someone said, hey, guys, Christmas creature that you just saw on TV today. Would you find it more shocking to learn that he would in the future become the undertaker's brother Kane or that he would become the mayor of Knoxville? <laughs> <laughs> now I could see, I could see them being worked into being Kane's brother or undertaker's brother, right. but it seemed almost like back to the future risk that he's the mayor now. You know what I mean? It's yeah. just like, that would never happen. <laughs> that would never happen. It's going to be somebody else, but it, no, he's apparently doing pretty good over that way. Exactly. And while he may have had an unfair advantage, Moondog Spike won the Moondog Battle Royal, which was basically <laughs> just a Royal Rumble with weapons involved. So, you know, that definitely plays into the favor of the Moondogs. All right. So with all that uh, summing up what took place the week before, that brings us to the January 2nd, 1993 episode. So let's get into it. Dave opened the show by letting us know that Corey Macklin is unfortunately on vacation this week and won't be joining us today. And that we'll be hearing from the superstar Bill Dundee. Let's take a listen real quick to what Dave had to say about that. Well, as I told you, we had a special announcement to make about Bill Dundee. This is kind of a happy and sad day together uh, regarding that because there aren't many living legends in anything. But when it comes to wrestling, one of them for sure is the superstar Bill Dundee. Every USWA fan and fans all over the uh, United States and the world know about Bill Dundee and uh, the great career. Uh, Bill has decided to make a career change. He has decided to accept an executive position with, uh, with another wrestling organization, with the WCW. And as a result... He has decided uh, he wants to say a farewell in style to all the fans in the USWA and has uh, decided on a farewell tour. More about that in a moment. Right now, just take a look at some of the highlights of the superstar, Bill Dundee. All right, so we're not going to take a look at the highlights of the superstar. <laughs> is that music we get us kicked off of? Uh, 
YouTube or wherever you're watching this. Um, the video actually that when I put the the video up on YouTube, uh, they had that old song "Memories" playing in the background, and they actually <laughs> muted that on YouTube. And I, I think they might have done us all a favor. Um, oh yeah. Now, before you guys comment on what this announcement is uh, that he just alluded to, let's quickly hear what the superstar has to say about it. There he is right here. You're looking at him uh, for the last time on USWA Championship Wrestling. As again, in case you joined us a couple of minutes late, Bill's accepted an executive position with another wrestling organization. And Bill, I, uh, I'm i happy for you. Congratulations on the, uh, on the new position. But uh, gosh, going to miss seeing you around here. Well, Dave, I appreciate the kind words, and for the last 20 years, I've been here every Saturday morning, and, you know, I, I've been thinking about this all week, and it didn't seem real hard when I was thinking about it, but it's awful hard to say it. You know, the, the wrestling fans, without the wrestling fans, there ain't no wrestling, so let's not mistake that. But to become more than that after 20 years, it's like, you know, little guys this big now, they're this big, this, man, I've been watching you all my life, you know. Well, that's true. 20 years I've been around here. And you get to love the people. I know a lot of them love me. Some, some you know, some me, some not, but most of them do. And, and I've had a good rapport with all the fans, and I just want to take this opportunity. And I talked to Eddie Martin. I said, hey, man, book me everywhere this week where USWA is going to go because I personally want to say goodbye. So I'm going to go down to WCW and see what happens down there. I don't know. Probably have to wear a suit and a tie. I don't know. But anyway, when I climb in this ring today for this TV match today, this is the last time it's going to be here. And then all week long, I'm going to be around where USWA is, and I just want to say... Goodbye to everybody personally. Dave, it's been a pleasure. Thank you, Thanks. Bill. It's been great watching you all this time in the ring there. Now, in retrospect, <laughs> to think that in 1993 that Dave and Bill was telling us this was going to be the last time we would see Bill Dundee in the right. studio here at TV5. That didn't exactly play out that way. <laughs> what do you guys think of it? It didn't last long, that's for sure. Um, I, I was telling Josh, and, and I'm, I'm not trying to poke fun or anything, I don't know if it's the video quality because it's so old, but when he came out, those tights were almost flesh colored and I thought he was Donald Duck in it for like a good two minutes. I'm like, okay, it's his last time and he's going out with a bang and I couldn't get past the interview where he's just sitting there talking and it just looks like he's wearing a jacket, and no pants. But with that said, <laughs> as a kid, I remember when this happened and I remember feeling sad because Dundee had been a part of, our like lives my whole life you know and, and the way they're announcing it too he's taking an executive right. position so that would indicate that he's not going to be a wrestler no. anymore after this farewell tour so yeah it was like a a moment of just oh you know yeah. because yeah. bill's not going to be there anymore yeah and bill's stepping out of the ring and you know we figured back then like well you know it's probably time and i think that was the intent honestly uh he did uh, you know, a lot of people, a couple of people that I've talked to have been like, well, that was bull. He went to be a manager. Like, no, he didn't. He actually did take a, uh, I don't know if it's considered an executive position, but it was definitely an office position with WCW. I remember they, uh, not long after this, WCW brought a, uh, a B or maybe even a C house show uh, to Columbus, Mississippi, to the Lavender Coliseum, where I had went and seen the Nightmares wrestle for Continental all those years. Uh, a... Like I say, B, maybe even C show that was headlined by the Junkyard Dog versus Dick Slater that heard the uh, the uh, s scattered audience in the arena chant, we want flair uh, throughout the entire thing. Um, but Bill was running around there uh, in uh, Zubaz and a airbrush shirt with his picture on it, wearing a fanny pack uh, with paper and his glasses on. And he was, you know, he was running the show and uh not long after that as the story goes uh they were going to put larry zabisco with lord stephen regal uh in that position and bill said everybody knows zabisco like nobody's gonna buy that like at least i've got an accident accent just let me do it and right. sir william was born uh, and he had that run as you know regal's manager and of course spoiler alert uh, this wasn't the end of Bill's wrestling career by a long shot. Uh, but we'll get to that later. As far as we know right now, this is Bill's swan song. He's about to have his very last TV match in the ring with Mean Mike Miller uh, of Portland Wrestling fame. And then he was going to go on a little uh, farewell <coughs> tour around the loop this week. So uh, Bill steps in the ring with Mean Mike Miller. Um 
I guess it was more of a fight than a match, even though as far as I know, this wasn't an angle. They didn't come into this hot. They didn't have any kind of uh, heat going into this. But, I mean, I've seen less punches thrown in a boxing match than <laughs> I mean, a wrestling match. And it's basically just uh, an exchange of punches for, for several minutes. But Dave Brown points out that Mike Miller uh, looks like he's been in a car wreck or something. He's got bandages all over his face. He's got a black eye. He looks pretty rough before the bell even rings. Uh, but they have a decent little match. It goes a few minutes until the master of terror hits the ring along with Mike samples and they attack Bill Dundee. Um, what do you guys think about the match up to the point that the master of terror and Mike samples come in? Well, I mean, like you just said, it was, it wasn't really much of a match at first. I was thinking, are these guys okay? Like, did they have some words in the back? Because, um, uh, it was like you said, just punch, kick, punch, kick. At one point, Bill, so Bill was actually one of my trainers when I started in wrestling. And I remember he showed us some like holes in case, you know, if, if you ever have a guy shoot on you in the ring. Yeah. And one of them was that little like arm drag thing that he did. It was like out of a waist lock. Yeah. And I saw him hit that move on him. And I was like, okay, Bill might be for real here. Like Bill might be like trying to beat up Mike Miller. And I'll be honest, I didn't remember Mike Miller. So yeah. when I saw him, I was like, man, this guy's like, shouldn't be given like bill should be taking this much from him it should just be bill dominating and uh so i was kind of like really intrigued by it like it was the first time i was watching it because i was like well i don't know who mike miller is and and i know who bill is and they're throwing punches and well some of these might be live mike mike miller it was always a name i would always read about you know like gene said he was from portland wrestling but I would always read and his name would be up there in the top for, for uh, Portland wrestling's rankings and PWI yeah. and stuff. So I knew he was like somebody, but yeah. I hadn't watched, you know, seen him very much either, but he's a big guy. So I figured maybe that's why Bill was just going hard on him because maybe uh, Mike Miller wasn't going to take any crap from Bill and vice versa, yeah. you know, and I didn't but it was really intense. Right. It seemed like yeah. it was a, uh, you know, a big deal. Yeah. And I, I didn't understand why they were pointing out, like you said, so much about Mike Miller's face. Well, he's sprinkling it in there. Yeah. 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 It, it, we find out later why we were definitely foreshadowing there, but yeah, it was, it almost felt awkward. Like why is Dave even pointing that out? <laughs> right. But, uh, but yeah, the way the heat, the match was so heated, you would think that we're setting up for his, his, uh, week run out, you know, his week long run leaving the territory was going to be against me, Mike Miller, but turns out, uh, it's not. So the Masters of Terror, uh, they are Ken Wayne and Ken Raper. Unfortunate pairing a name. Anyway, <laughs> right. Uh, <laughs> uh, only one of them appear at this point in the show. I believe it's Ken Raper, just based off his movement, because it didn't. It didn't look like Ken to me, but I, I don't know. Uh, but let's take a look. So they 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 jump Bill. They put the boots to him in the ring. They throw him out on the floor, and this happens. Terror throws Dundee down on the floor. Oh, come on. Stop this. Got him up in the air. Drop him with, with a pile driver on the floor. Mike Samples egging him on. Master of Terror has him up in the air again for the second time. He drops Dundee with a pile driver. Samples over with a boot to the back. Master of Terror continues to work on him. Mike Samples. Nick. Okay, so let, this is where I feel like this is a good time to to state this disclaimer. <laughs> yeah. So we we talked about at the beginning of the show what big fans of Memphis wrestling and wrestling in general we are, and so you know we're here to do a podcast because you know we want to go back and because I feel like this is kind of an, an ignored era. There's tons of podcasts about Memphis wrestling from the '80s. Um, I'm even involved in one about '85, but there's not a lot of talk about the '90s. Um, yeah. There's going to be some times, not everything, you know, not everything in Memphis wrestling was great all the way back into the eighties. I mean, there's stuff going on in 85 that me and Ray Russell are watching. And I'm like, well, I don't remember this being better than this. <laughs> you know, uh, so we're not here to dunk on Memphis wrestling. We're, I mean, if people are going to get upset at times, we're going to have some fun with some things. And these two pile drivers are probably going to be a couple of those things because you know, in, in Memphis wrestling for years, um, you know, 
a lot has been built around the pile driver. You know, Lawler has used it. You know, they first of all, you know, years and years before this, decades even, you know, they made the pile driver illegal in Tennessee through the athletic commission to make it, you know, a band maneuver, make it mean something. And, you know, Andy Kaufman laid in a Memphis hospital perfectly fine for days in traction to sell a pile driver. Guys would get pile driven in the ring sometimes and be out for weeks. And if anybody got pile driven on the floor, hang it up. They're mm-hmm. out. They're they're getting on a stretcher and leaving. They're, you're not that might be how they leave the territory. You know, right. they're going somewhere else. Uh, now we watched Bill just take two on the concrete floor, and then followed up by some stomps that couldn't have been their proudest moment either. Uh, <laughs> right. What do you guys take on that? Am I being too harsh? What's your thoughts? <laughs> No, I mean, I feel like whenever you see somebody give a pal driver and they put their hand down to catch themselves because concrete's hard to take a butt bump on. I don't know if you know oh, that, yeah. but I mean, I felt like more it would probably hurt uh, the master of terror more than it did Bill. Oh, yeah. From all that weight yeah. coming down. Uh, but it's like you said, you know, like you look at this and you as a kid or when I was younger and I saw this, I was like, OK, they attacked it, you know, it. it yeah wasn't the fact that he was, you know, brutally beaten or anything like it was just, okay, he got attacked. Uh, but yeah, like you said, it was looking back at it. It's like, mm. but it does help though, that the pile drivers were kind of gingerly given. Yep. And like, even as a kid, you could see that and say, well, maybe that's why what's going to yeah. happen in the future is going to happen. He didn't get future. all of it. He didn't right. get all of it. So then I question, like, so did someone from the sidelines who saw those two pile drivers, did they tell Mike samples? Hey, See if you can give him a better one. Because in this, oh, here's Mike Samples coming back. He nails Danny Davis, picks up Bill Dundee, and he's set up for a pile driver. The third pile driver on Bill Dundee out here on the floor. Davis and Lawler going back to work on it. And finally, Samples and the master of terror. Now, admittedly, that one looked that one looked a little better. Um, but of course, then you got Dave in the background for a third pile driver. <laughs> right. So I'm thinking at this point, because I haven't seen this in I don't know when, probably since it happened. Um, I'm thinking, all right, well, let's send Bill's headed to Atlanta. You know, farewell. We won't yeah. see him again, but we'll see. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I love how Mr. Uncle Danny there fell asleep at the wheel, too. That was all I could think of is like, I don't think I want Mr. Uncle Danny watching my back if somebody has pal driven me twice because he was right there in position. And just totally got knocked out of the way. He, gave me, he got another one on him. So oh, yeah, like, allowed him to get a third one. Yeah, on him. Um, he's not Mr. Hughes. Yeah, yeah. Mr. I would not definitely not want to. Yeah, yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So on the show, we go to break after that, obviously, because we've just seen Bill Dundee get take three pile drivers on the floor. We got to, we got to restore order, folks. Uh, so then we return from the break with uh, Dave Brown interviewing the King. And uh, Jerry Lawler uh, says he thinks that 1993 will be an exciting year for wrestling. He says in recent times, the competition in wrestling has been more between the different organizations than between the wrestlers. And then Lawler says that's bad for fans. He also thinks promotions like WWF and WCW are taking notice of the wrestlers in the USWA as evidenced by uh, WCW hiring Bill D. And he said also that, the WWF realized that the King was one of the most exciting wrestlers on TV, and that's why fans have been seeing him on WWF television lately. But Lawler reassures the fans that he won't be leaving home. Uh, he, he will always compete in the USWA. Uh, he alludes to Mike Miller's face, but says he won't address it and will leave what happened to everyone's imagination. We had no reason to think Lawler knew anything about Mike Miller's face or right. was involved, so I don't, that kind of seemed random. Um, before we move to the next point in this, um, I feel like we kind of need to touch on this because this is a touchy situation as far as I'm concerned for years at this point in 1993, Jerry Lawler has taken shots at the WWF. He's called him a cartoon. He's basically implied over the years that that WWF cartoon stuff's all fake But down here in Memphis. We really fight. We really wrestle and all this. And now he's showing up on WWF TV he has to wonder how's the Memphis fans going to feel about it. So uh, I guess this was kind of his way of addressing it. Uh, what do you guys think about that? Well, I just thought it was kind of weird. Like you're talking about, like Lawler would say that 
the WWF and WCW's world champions aren't true world champions because they only fight people within their own organizations. And like you say, uh, all of a sudden now we're seeing him on the television. So like as a kid, just looking at it through that lens, I thought it was extremely odd. And if you think back how like cutthroat things were back then and how serious it was to keep, you know, uh, the WWF separate, WCW yep. separate, Memphis separate. And then you've got a guy who maybe at that point in time was a contracted WCW guy, Bill, being with a contracted around, at least working with a contracted WWF guy, Lawler. You know, it, it's just it was weird. Yeah, and I think what makes this even more interesting is uh, I think this was after the fact that Lawler had sued Vince for announcing the King was going to be in, you know, on his show. Right. So it makes it even worse. But I think as a kid, I looked at this like, finally, you know, because you're yeah. raised in the South, you know, finally, we're going to tell those Northerners what's, for, you know. So when Lawler came in being a heel in, in WWF, I was like, yeah, get him, Lawler. You know, we're, we're going to have to listen to all this Yankee talk anymore, you know, <laughs> uh, beat him up. But, you know, you're the king. So I looked at it in the, on, the, on the other end of the spectrum. Like, I was proud for Lawler because he was standing up for a Southern wrestling fans, you know? And it, and it wasn't as far as like him being a heel there and a baby face in Memphis, that wasn't even really that weird. Cause we'd already done that with the Texas feud, you know, mm -hmm. where he was, he's on my TV every day on ESPN as a complete heel. And then Saturday morning, he's on my TV on WMC and he's a baby face. But it's like, well, you know, it's Texas. Those people right. <laughs> jerks out there. Of course he's a bad guy there. <laughs> right. Um, so the next aspect of this promo, which I, to me is the most fun, uh, Lawler brings up the Moondog Battle Royal from last week, and he talks about this was a battle royal where weapons were legal, and he mentions that he came in with a trash can and he worked folks over. And then he proceeds to complain that Mike Samples <laughs> took something out of his pocket and hit him with it, costing him ten grand. <laughs> I guess the trash can was okay because it didn't fit in his pocket. Right. Uh, yeah, they, when I hit somebody with it, everybody sees it. You know, I'm not a coward with my weapons. <laughs> exactly. Here's a little look at that. Real Samples quick. reaches in his pocket, pulls out some kind of object there, and knocks my lights out. Well, Mike Samples, like I said, I feel like you cost me $10,000, and so that there's no... No uh, misunderstanding about it. Let's just take a little, just a, take just a second, take a look at what Mike Samples did, and then you're going to realize, punk, exactly why the king wants a little bit of your rear end. <laughs> Lola's got a trash can. Mike Samples, now in Jerry in there. He clobbered him with something. He pinned Lola two, three to get him. That's it. Mike Samples, everybody saw it. You got it out. <laughs> Hell, a Jerry in there. Hell, a Jerry. Right. <laughs> I can't wait when he comes back next week. <laughs> oh. uh, but yeah, that to me was as fun as uh, the fact that he laid it out completely like, hey, as a moon dog battle roll, anything goes. I was in there with a the trash can just laid it out. <laughs> But then that piece of shit, Mike Samples, <laughs> reaches in his pocket and right. hits me with something. <laughs> and I don't even like. What's funny was it was like it looked like Lawler was just hitting whoever was around, just yeah. giving them straight jabs with it, like "f you, f you, f you." And then Mike Samples, if you looked at this from a Hills point of view, Mike Samples just got tired of getting hit by a trash can and walloped that guy. And he's like that bully Lawler yeah. going around screwing everybody over. <laughs> I got something for you. Ooh, and if you think you saw an example of that this week, wait till next week. We'll get there. Uh, <laughs> All right. Well, right now we're going to take not only a break on the USWA show, we're going to take a quick break here on the podcast to hear one of our great uh, podcasting partners. And then we'll be right back with more of this episode of USWA. <laughs> Hey guys, this is Wolfie D from PG-13. Check out my podcast, Live and in Color with Wolfie D, every Monday at noon. We're talking Memphis. We're talking ECW, WCW, WWF, everywhere that I've been. We even have some great guests, some Hall of Famers on the show with us. Every Monday at noon, Live and in Color with Wolfie D. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Give Me Back My Pro Wrestling. The podcast that's based on the old school, but can still help you find the good stuff from today. 
Jimmy Street and the Plastic Sheik, Jared, are the undisputed tag team champions of the wrestling podcast world. From thought-provoking topics to superstar interviews to action figure expertise, this team does it all. And all they ask is, give me back my pro wrestling! Every other Thursday, wherever you listen to podcasts. All right, so at this point, we come back from the break, and uh, the USWA Southern Champion Jeff Jarrett is here, and he's just out here to point out, to let us know, to come out to the show in Dyersburg, Tennessee. Also, he'll be doing a meet and greet at the local video store. And then he tells us about a big show coming to the school in Houston, Mississippi, which was only 20 minutes from my house at the time. I had no idea at the time where I would have been there. Uh, but that was fun. Like So, real quick, let's talk about another aspect of Memphis wrestling. And this goes back to CWA up into the USWA days. So, the, US, the Memphis television was 90 minutes long. And basically was a 90-minute promo for the Monday night card at the Coliseum. However, in the other towns in the territory, they got a edited 60-minute version that cut out all the direct references to the Coliseum in Memphis. It took out all these little Jarrett's talking about being in Dyersburg or tonight we're coming to so-and-so. Um, and those towns were on what they called the bicycle. So them towns were a week behind. So this Saturday, they're seeing what we saw live in Memphis last Saturday. Um, which, you know, we've talked about over on the uh, the Memphis Wrestling 85 show with me and Ray. Had to be a bit of a challenge sometimes for some of the guys, you know, cutting promos or for Lance interviewing them because you had to keep straight. All right, well, this is for this week, which was last week, which, like, we ran into a couple instances where, like, you know, Mike Sharp rattles off the wrong stipulation for a match because he's talking about today, but all the other promos, I guess he had shot, he'd been talking about last week. So I don't know. To me, that's always kind of a fun aspect of all this that you had to keep that straight. And then you, you're, you know, on TV today, you're talking about what's happening Monday night in Memphis. Then you're going to get in a car and you're going to go to Nashville and have a match based off last Saturday's TV and last Monday night's show that you've been doing all week long throughout the territory. So a little bit of a different time then as far as how the TV works. Yeah, I wasn't aware that it was like that when I was a kid. Like, whenever I first figured that out, it was the first summer that I went up to uh, Uncle Danny's school. I don't even know if it was called Ohio Valley Wrestling at that point. I think it was just, yeah, Nightmare Inc. was on the business card or whatever. But um, at that point, he had already trained like the Phantoms and uh, Doug Basham and stuff like that, but he hadn't called it OVW. Either way, I go up there. And I'm watching the Saturday morning, and I'm like, "This, this is last week. What the yeah. hell?" And it's it's only sixty minutes. And they told me, "No, no, that's uh, that's all last week. Anywhere other than Memphis, or you you get their TV or whatever. If you're if you get Memphis's TV, you get the real stuff. And if not, you're you're all a week behind. That was just it was really weird to me. But um, I always thought how weird it would be if you were traveling down to Memphis to catch a live show and you were in one of those markets, you would be a week off. Like, yes. you know, why does that guy have a shaved head now? And where's Dundee at? <laughs> like, <laughs> like, where is everybody at? You know, but, you know, kudos to the re- the wrestlers, man. I mean, like yeah. you always hear those war stories of late nights and uh, you name the drug from whichever guy, but like to keep up with all that mentally. And I'm sure yeah. they had help along the way, but still, I mean, uh, you know, if I have a late night, I'm not going to know shit the next day. Yeah. And, you know, Mick Foley talked about it in his book about how that was just odd to him that they were basically doing a loop and doing the whole show over again, you know, in you know, the other territories because he got some grief about something he was doing and they were like, you know, well, you shouldn't be doing that. And Mick was like, well, you're running, you know, towns that are like two hours apart a week behind and. You know, it was just the first time I'd ever heard of that. You know, I, I just never how, knew how they would do it if somebody from like Indiana would come down to watch, you know, a Memphis show live. They'd be so messed up that they were a week back. I wonder if they ever knew. I can't believe that didn't happen more because, like you say, a lot of those towns weren't that far apart. It, right. it wasn't out of the realm of possibility somebody could have gotten their car in Memphis and went to Nashville or vice versa. Right. 
right. and then seen the same show again because they would do that. You know, somebody would lose the 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 belts in Memphis on a Monday night, and then the other team would get they'd hand them back to them. And they'd go lose them in Evansville the next night. And they'd go lose them in Louisville, and they would lose right. them. And you know, each town got to see that team win the titles, eat, like it was happening in in their town, which is yeah. you know, in the in the era of kayfabe. I can't believe that isn't a bigger deal. Didn't hang them up more than a lot of this stuff, you know, because people really, you know, and I know Mick talked about it in his book. He referred to him, you know, about how those. Uh, those tapings at Disney used to really expose some things because you had guys cutting promos about losing belts they hadn't won yet and things right. like that. <laughs> same lines, but and it's a completely different era. But maybe they were just banking on every everybody being like us when we were growing up, just dirt poor and not being able to because that was our thing. We couldn't go to Memphis because we were just poor, and maybe that was the demographic back then was just everybody just can't afford. To drive from you know Louisville to Nashville to Memphis to catch these shows, so they're going to be in the dark, right? And they didn't talk about it on Memphis TV. I mean, they would give like the local towns they were coming to, but you didn't necessarily know in Memphis that they were going to be in Nashville that night, or they did Evansville on Wednesday, or that you know, like you would have had to know somebody from that town to even know that they did those shows every week. I guess so. I guess that was another factor as well. Here's a question. You know, they would show like somebody losing a title, like at the Mid South Coliseum. Did they edit that to show them losing it at whatever facility? That's what they did. Yes. So, because like we're covering eighty five, and we're some of the stuff we're seeing like mm-hmm. some of the like shows from the other towns, and mm-hmm. so yeah, they would show, and it would be the same finish that we saw from Memphis. Like for instance, there was a match where kind of a convoluted finish with the. Uh, the interns and uh, the dirty white boys for the tag team titles. And then you see the clip from, you know, I forget which town it was, Jackson, Tennessee or wherever it was. Nah, Jackson's not far enough away. I guess maybe it's Evansville, whatever. The fuck. Right. But anyway, and it was the same exact finish beat for beat, but it was from, you know, it was, it was footage from that town, you know, where, where they, where they did it again. So it's kind of, I don't know, like I say, it's, it's just a fun aspect to me that, you know, they were able to keep all that straight. Because like you, like, you know, Josh was saying, as, as hungover as a lot of them were and <laughs> out of their head, you know, I mean, you put that camera in your face like, wait a minute, what what, what town is this? Right. Is this, is this the week we're doing the Southern Street Fight or is this the week we're doing the cage or is is the hair on the line this week? Or, yeah, and poor, and poor Mike Miller had to beat the crap out of his face every week. <laughs> <laughs> for like a good, yeah, for a good ten days. Speaking of Mike Miller, so at this point in the show, after we hear from Jeff and hear about his appearance at the local video store, uh, Dave Brown proceeds to tell the convoluted story about Jerry Lawler being at a New Year's Eve party where Mike <laughs> Miller was there being drunk and unruly. So Lawler was asked by whoever was putting on the party to ask Miller to leave which led to Lawler asking Miller to leave. Miller refuses to leave. I guess Lawler gives him the injuries to his face in the process that we saw earlier. And apparently this story wasn't going to be told, but since Miller attacked you know, Lawler, uh, he had to go ahead and tell the story. So this is what happened. Lawler was doing at the end of his promo earlier. We forgot to mention this. I got sidetracked. I apologize. Uh, let's take a look at, as, as Lawler was finishing up his promo earlier, uh, this is what happened. Thank pal. Me and you, I got a little date with you. Look out, Dave, look out, look out. Mike Miller throwing a chair at Lawler. What is going on here? Miller, man, he came out with that folding metal chair up in the air, ready to throw it, and he did. Sorry, I got sidetracked. We were talking about Lawler and the WWF thing and all that. So at the end of that promo, Mike Miller came out and attacked him, and that's what, that happened before Jeff come out to tell us about the video store and Dyersburg or whatever. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, so you know we don't understand what's going on. Miller comes out and throws his chair at Lawler, and now Dave's explaining that all right. Well, since Mike attacked him, I got to tell you that they were at a New Year's Eve party, and Mike Miller was drunk, and you know blah blah blah. Uh, and then we move on from there for now. But believe me. We'll hear more about this convoluted <laughs> New Year's Eve party story uh, here in a moment. Can right I say, now, 
Oh, please go ahead. Can I say that? Could we trust anyone to throw a chair in the strike zone as good as Mike Miller did just then? He was like 30 feet away. And he flung that chair, and it perfectly hit Lawler. Like he'd done it before. Like he had, like he had thrown chairs his entire life. He is the Nolan Ryan of chair throwing. You would think a guy with a messed up face would not be able to throw a chair like that. But he's squinting out of that one eye, and he's just dead eye. Like I remember, like watching this back and hearing Lawler go, "Watch out, Dave!" And I'm like, "What is he talking about?" That's how long it took for that chair to get there. That's <laughs> yes. how accurate Mike Miller is throwing a chair. He's like. He's like Uncle Rico. He's like, what do you think I could throw a chair over those mountains over there? And he would, and he'd hit Lawler right in the face with it. I love that clip. Like, uh, yeah. I'm going to hang on to that clip and put it on the Facebook page because, yeah, it's and, and kudos to Lawler for uh, looking out for for Dave Brown there because, like you said, <laughs> at watching it the first time, he's like, look out, Dave, and there's this long pause. It's like, what? And boom, here comes the chair. <laughs> Yeah, he couldn't have threw that any. I mean, if they'd have done that five more times, I can't imagine he could have pulled it off any more perfect ever again. Yeah. <laughs> it was dead on. But right now, Danny Davis is coming out here, and he's pretty dadgum heated about what they did to Bill Dundee. His brothers would be. Now, this week, Bill should be on his farewell tour, you know, saying goodbye to all of his fans and everything. After all, he has had an illustrious career around here. 20 years in USWA. Well, that's something that a lot of people wish they could say. Well, Masters of Terror and Mike Samples, let me tell you something. I don't take kindly to you doing something to my friend. Right now, he should be shaking hands with his friends back in the dressing room. But no, because of you, he's laying back there flat on his back with an ice pack on his neck. Well, let me tell you something. We never claim to be the biggest. We never claim to be the baddest. But one damn thing is for sure, nobody's going to take advantage of my friend or somebody that I could call my brother. Do you understand? So I went to promoter Eddie Marlin, and I asked him point blank, since Bill is not going to be able to be there because of what you guys done, I want both Masters of Terror in a single match. This week, I want to wrestle one guy early and one guy late. And I can promise you one thing. When it comes to dropping somebody on their head, I know how to do it. Now, let me tell you something. I sit you out on a stretcher before, and you were able to come back. Well, I promise both of you something this time. You are not going to get away with what you've done to Bill Dundee. You'll both be carried out, and that's a promise for me, and that'll be a farewell message to Bill Dundee. That's the word Danny Davis wants both of them one at a time. and. Uh... Because of what you guys done. <laughs> yeah, Danny has to shoulder some of that responsibility for just watching Mike Samples. <laughs> Give him another one. That third time. <laughs> uh, but no, dude, like watching that back, like I, Danny had Danny had that voice. You know what I mean? Danny had that voice when he said something. You really believed it. Get out of my bag. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, he when he said something, it was like, you know, you knew he would probably cash in on what he was saying 100 percent, and and even you know though he didn't sell their size you know or or how how bad dundee was hurt was just with an ice pack you believe like yeah dundee's probably laying back there with an ice pack he was believable if, if i've said this for years if danny davis had been larger in, in stature at least taller there's no telling where he would have made it in the business as far as like WWF, WCW. That's the only thing that held him back. Cause you know, in 87, you know, he got in shape, he got all jacked. He had the, he had the promo. He had, like you say, that intensity. He was a great worker in the ring. That's the only thing that held him back was just his size or he would have been a, a much bigger star and, and totally deserved to be. Uh, but that promo right there, completely plays into what we were just talking about, about the whole bicycle thing. Because they just laid out right there that Bill Dundee's hurt, he's not going to be able to make it, and that now Danny Davis is going to take on the Masters of Terror in two separate singles matches at different points on the card. Remember that for later. All right, moving on. <laughs> <laughs> we won't spoil it right now, but just remember right. that, folks. Right. Uh, because that will come into play later on. But they had to get that on video for when they chopped the show up to send it to the other towns because ah. Bill may or may not show up Monday night, but he ain't coming to them other towns. So <laughs> we, just cover, we, just cover, we just covered that base. All right, so up next, uh, we've got the King, Jerry Lawler, taking on Mr. Paradise. Uh, so let's take a look here. 
or Mr. Paradise. <laughs> um, <laughs> aptly named, I guess. Mr. Paradise, for those who know, if any of you are familiar with the old $5 high spots, $5 wrestling, Mr. Paradise looks like Jeff the Hitman Hart from $5 <laughs> wrestling and doesn't wrestle quite as good. Uh, oh. But, uh, <laughs> uh, but yeah, so, you know, he, uh, he comes in, he, uh, and another thing that struck me about the name Mr. Paradise, it reminded me, there's a famous quote from Kevin Nash when they asked him about the Oz character that he said, one of the first things he said to Dusty Rhodes about the Oz character was that Oz is not a person. It's a geographic location. <laughs> right. <laughs> I would think that much the same Mr. Paradise would kind of be the, uh, the same way, but, uh, Jerry Lawler, uh, gets the win. And, uh, me, Mike Miller shows up again and that turned out exactly like, and so I, uh, I didn't get us a clip of, of that because <laughs> you know, as you can imagine more punches and rolling around, uh, which led to, uh, our second, second match of the day ends in our second interference DQ of the day, uh, here on the USWA <laughs> leads to a brawl and a big pull apart. And I'm sorry. I hate freaking pull aparts. I always have since I was a little kid. I remember watching the Road Warriors against Jerry Lawler and Austin Idol and it ending in a big pull apart and me absolutely hating it. And uh, then I got involved in wrestling, had to be involved in some pull aparts. And the only thing worse than watching a pull apart is being involved in a damn pull apart. <laughs> right. uh, what are you guys' thoughts on that? I always hated pull aparts. Even when I was wrestling, it was like, all right, everybody needs to come out and pull these two guys apart. And I'm like, why would I care that, you know, that guy's fighting that guy? You know, if anything, I'd try to probably attack the baby face if I'm the heel. Why would I not try to attack the baby face while I was out there, get a cheap shot in? Like, I am so concerned with pulling my friend off of their friend that I'm not going to use my hatred to beat up my enemy. No, I was like, I always hated them. It's like, I, I don't yes. mind having security and referees, but when you do the locker room clearing pull apart, it always kind of felt like, a bit cheesy to me. I don't know why. It's just, it felt like we're suspending our disbelief that I'm not going to try to take a shot at my enemy. Exactly. Yeah. And then there's the whole awkwardness of it. If you got nine people holding one guy, nine guy holding the other guy, and they hold them, they hold them, hold them. oh, and they get away. And then, yeah. then they get, and then we do it again. He shrimped out. <laughs> yeah. Come on. But all right. So we've now established through the chair throwing, through Dave Brown's story <laughs> Year's Eve party, and now our second interference disqualification, and the big old pull apart. There is a problem between the King and Mean Mike Miller. So we go to break, and when we return from break, Mean Mike Miller is at the desk. He's blown up uh, <laughs> severely. Uh, <laughs> Dave Brown to tell his version of the New Year's Eve party story, or as he put it, I'm going to tell all these idiots what happened. <laughs> Miller says he's not a bad person, but then leads the fans to loudly chant Lawler's name. Uh, Miller says he was at a New Year's Eve party, and he saw Jerry Lawler having milk and cookies and signing autographs. Uh, I'm still waiting to hear how these two ended up at the same New Year's Eve. <laughs> right. They're both wrestlers, but they just do not look like they run in the same circles. Uh, for any reason. But anyway, uh, Miller says he had a couple of drinks and was talking to a lady friend uh, when Lawler came and told him to leave. Miller made it clear he only leaves the place when he's ready to leave, and he wasn't ready to leave yet. So <laughs> he says Lawler sucker punched him and assaulted him, causing him to ring in the new year flat on his back. And I'm assuming he had actually planned for his lady friend to ring in the new year flat on her back in the bed. So that's not <laughs> Uh, and then Miller says, I may not be one of the top in America, but I'm going to get my advantage. Whatever the hell that means. I mean, <laughs> what y'all think of this promo? I, I, uh, yeah. Uh, it was just, you know, me and Josh talked about it. And, you know, they always say the truth is somewhere in the middle. You know, there's your story, my story, and then the truth. Uh, and putting the two stories together from you know, from Lawler and uh, or from Dave and then from um, uh, Mike Miller, it kind of sounds like 
you could kind of believe Mike Miller's story a little bit more. Like you could be like, yeah, I could see where Jerry just beat up a drunk guy at a party. <laughs> like yeah. I could go with that, you know? Uh, but I gotta love the fact that Mike Miller sold himself so well. You know, I might not be the best. <laughs> I'm not <laughs> I'm even top, top 10. In, I'm the top in America, <laughs> but I'm going to get my advantage. Which sounds like the guy on your t-shirt there. Right. Uh, yeah <laughs> wrong is wrong i don't care what my ranking is <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah um it was it, it, yeah I, it's funny because you know it's long been said that you know jerry jarrett had that sign on his office that said personal issues draw money so that's what we're trying to do here is is make this personal uh but again you know Lawler kind of, if you're looking at this from just completely kayfabe perspective, it's like, how dare this guy be drunk at a New Year's Eve party? Like, I'm guessing <laughs> right. Mike Miller wasn't the only one guy, but, you know. Right. Uh, and you kind of sympathize with him, you yeah. know, because he, he's he's at a party and he's, he's like, just I trying leave. to talk to a lady. Yeah, exactly. and I leave when I want to leave, you know. It's kind of like, well, yeah. I mean, it doesn't make you a great house guest, but. Well, the it, thing about it is it said that the uh, the whoever was the owner of the house yeah. or whatever they were at asked Lawler to yeah. ask him to leave. Like you, you don't even own owner this in, house. Didn't the owner invite him? Yeah. You don't even own this house yeah. and you're telling me to leave. No, I kind of, Mike Miller kind of has my sympathy here a little bit. And you know, he knows he's not uh, on top of the world or yeah. whatever, but he's got that far in him. Yeah. And Lawler's punching down, and like literally a, punching down <laughs> and literally punching down. <laughs> he's just had a few drinks. He's trying to mack on this lady over here and, uh, and Lawler's going to, come over there and uh, shut him down. And again, I, you make a good point. Like, okay, so this guy obviously invited Miller there. What, did he crash the party? Like, yeah. are we to assume this is Jerry Jarrett's house we're talking about? I don't, I mean, you know, I don't know. But anyway, I can only assume that perhaps we may get to hear Jerry Lawler's version of events before this is over. But right now, we we'll take another commercial break on the show. And then when we come back from the break, we're going to get some highlights right here of, uh, the Brian Christopher Jeff Jarrett match from last week and the head shaving. So let's take a look at that real quick. Well, look at Zeke Lewis has that chain, hooks Jeff food with it. He thought he had a pin. He got it. One, two, three. Hey, Jeff gets the win. <laughs> and look at Rivers over here. Zeke Rivers is thinking of Brian Christopher. <laughs> I hope you know what you're doing. You are going to be sued. I'm going to sue this whole promotion. Zeke River is in the chair getting his head shaved. And boy, Kelly from Arisell done a good job on it. It's off. <laughs> he was so lighter from having that haircut that he jumped when he got out of the chair. I heard him like a jack in the box. Uh, <laughs> Do you know who Michael Berryman is? Yes. <laughs> that looks just like yeah. <laughs> that's, that's a good which call. That is which is funny because <laughs> independently, I had wrote in my notes, uh, he went from looking like the head of a cult to a religious, like, zealot cult follower. <laughs> you know, and it's just that wispy hair that had to leave. Yeah, and that was some long hair, too. Yeah. He went from Kenny G to Michael Berryman. And what? <laughs> I'll tell you what, they've come a long way with those clippers and these hair matches. Though. I remember back in the day when they get those clippers and it, I mean, they were ripping half the hair out of their head. It wouldn't, they wouldn't hardly cut, man. That was whizzing that hair right off his head. Like I was, I was totally impressed with that. So <laughs> kudos for that. And my other takeaway from, from what we saw there. And if you're listening to this audio wise, and I'm sure most of you are, the very first thing we see in that video is Jeff Jarrett going for the pin with a handful of tights. <laughs> I threw my hands up while we were watching it. I was like, what? Um, Another good guy. Well, he, had, he had to short. do something because all he basically did, like I have rolled over on my wife in bed harder than that pin. <laughs> like uh, he was trying to do that old thing that Barry Wyndham was good about. Was that rule of Ric yeah. Flair was good about when every time you catch a cross body, you'd roll out of it. Mm -hmm. And I guess the timing was off. And yeah, during the suplex, off. Yeah, I mean, and and he he couldn't, so he had to do something. Uh, but I mean, it was Jeff was the baby, you know, getting in his well, advantage. Yeah. 
I mean, so what we didn't see in that clip, but if you watched, if you watched the match, and folks, if you want to watch the whole episode, it is available uh, on my YouTube channel. We'll talk more about that later on. But during the course of that match, Jeff got hit with a chain. He got hit with powder. He took a cane shot from Zeke Rivers. He kicked out of each one of those separately before finally <laughs> pinning Brian Christopher with a handful of tights after that very awkward roll there from that, like you say, that revert reversal uh, or what was supposed to be a reversal. Uh, but yeah, you know, people used to talk about how Hogan was the, the most cheapness baby face of all time, but I don't think those people saw Memphis wrestling because there was quite <laughs> a bit of cheating going on from our, our favorites down here. Right. And, uh, and then, so Jeff Jarrett stepped in the ring with a man known as the bounty hunter. Let's take a quick look at the corner. Yeah. Referee is right there. Calling for the breaks and hey, out of the corner, back to the center of the ring. Look at the bounty hunter. Found it on Jeff. Jeff reverses, moves it back into the corner and returns the favor. Bounty hunters. Just gets into the corner. Jeff sets himself and that boot puts the bounty hunter down on the mat. Jeff Jarrett goes after him. Backs him into the rope. Upper arm coming off the other side. Bounty hunter back to the ropes, looking across the way, and Jeff this time with a close line puts him right back down to the mat. Bounty hunter moves a little slower than he did when the match began. Yeah. Snaps him down, covers, this might be it. One, two, it is it. And the Southern Champion has just... I wish somebody would have gave uh, the bounty hunter your grandmother's number to get some gear made. <laughs> <Holy>. <laughs> he right. looked like a cat burglar. Yeah. They just go through and like, here's a Brinks commercial. Let's get that guy off of here. <laughs> Bring him in. I told him it looked like a, our dummy that we made yes. to practice on. <laughs> we had a life. wrestling dummy when we were kids made of like a ski mask, a shirt, some pants, and we had shoes Gloves on it, but kept and, knocking the shit yeah. out of ourselves with the shoes. Uh, but yeah, it looked like our dummy come to life. Yeah, and who knew he eventually uh, got signed to the USWA and uh, <laughs> made it made it before you guys did. So that's yeah. a real yeah. shame. But, uh, but dude, Jeff looked like a million bucks in that, man. Like that. You know, he was cut, he was big, he he, he looked like money yeah. in, in that match. Except for the DDT, he looked like... Well, I'm just, just saying, uh, physically, yes, he, yeah, he yeah. had it, man. The DDT for Jeff always looked kind of weird, though, for me. But, but yeah, he yeah, looked he, like a million dollars. He went through... Uh, so, uh, early on, he had that you know, drop kick off the second rope he would do. And then, and then for a little bit, he would just do a drop kick. And it took him a while to land on a finish, you know. And then he started doing yeah. that leaping DDT like that. Like you said, it was always a little awkward. And, and some of that had to do with him. And some of it had to do with the way, especially the enhancement guys would take that. Yeah. I, I, and watching ahead some weeks here, preparing for some of this, I've seen it taken way, way worse than that. But yeah, man, he looked he looked great. You know, he wasn't the skinny little kid that he was starting out in, you know, eighty seven and eighty eight. And uh you, you knew at this point that it wouldn't be long before Vince would come calling. Um but you know, I assumed he would come in as a, a fiery baby face there as he was here, but we would find out differently. But we'll get there in due time. Uh so uh, as that match was ending, uh, Brian Christopher and the newly bald Zeke Rivers appear at ringside and uh, and demand that, that Jeff come over to the desk. And at that point, we get almost an exact replay of what we saw last week uh, where, you know, Brian wants a rematch. And Jeff states at the very beginning that if you're not putting your hair on the line, Brian, I don't even want to talk to you. Not even going to talk about a title match unless your hair is on the line. There's your baby face drawing the line in the sand. <laughs> right. However, <laughs> we, we go <laughs> on to uh, he offers up Mr. Clyde's hair. Uh, Jeff says he didn't want to hear it. He leaves or goes to leave, rather. Um, I'm not going to go through this whole scenario. Long story <laughs> short, in the end, we're having a match for. Uh, Mr. Clyde's hair, and there's some cash on the line with the promise of Brian said he'd put his hair on the line a week after next or some such. <laughs> it was uh, a strange uh, deal. It's, <laughs> it's not my favorite you know, angle, but, you know, Memphis has gone to Memphis, and this is like the most Memphis angle in the world right here where you're 
you're yeah. you're stacking all these stipulations and hairs on the line and this guy's hairs on the line. But this right here was uh we got one I got one little piece from the promo here. Well, I'll say little, it's about a minute long. But let's check this out. And this will kind of give you guys an a uh, idea of, of how this played out with these Brian Christopher Jeff Jarrett promos here for a few different things. Big deal. I don't care about Zeke's hair, and I don't care about Mr. Clyde's hair. Unless your hair is on the line, don't even talk to me anymore, Brian. Hey, right, listen. Come here, Jeff Jarrett. Come here, boy. Come here. Come here, sissy. Come here, sissy. Come here. Uh, yeah, you're sissy. Come back over here. Hey, this week, listen to me. I will put Clyde's hair on the line. And a thousand dollars. One thousand dollars. How does that sound, Jeff Jarrett? You look real spiffy today in your in your suit. I guess you got best dress when you were in high school, but I don't think you got most intelligence. Do you understand English? Unless it's your hair, no go. Boy, I understand English, boy. I was a valedictorian of my class, you understand? I'm very smart. <laughs> that was my whole point of playing that clip. Yeah. <laughs> was Brian saying the valedictorian? Now, the best part of that, to me, uh, that could have just been Brian being a great heel and saying it that way to be a heel. But for those of us who kind of know Brian, there's also a good chance that that's just how Brian thought you said valedictorian. It could go either way. <laughs> <laughs> but I, one thing I really want people to take away from these podcasts, if you're listening to these, watching these with us, if you aren't familiar uh, with USWA from this area era uh, or area for that matter, uh, if you only know Brian Christopher as Grandmaster Sex A of Too Cool, that's cool. But man, Brian Christopher was such a great heel. Uh, I mean, he had such an ability to get under people's skin on the mic and just in general, uh, be it <laughs> on the mic or behind the curtain. Uh, I mean, he was just really great at it. And that's one of the things I really hate is that he never got a run as a heel on a national level because I think they really missed the boat. And I know his size was a factor, just like with Danny Davis and things like that. But man, uh, you go back and watch the USWA from 92 straight on. And uh, and he had his moments as a great babyface, and he certainly played that role well as also. And there was times where they really needed him to play that role, especially when, you know, Lawler's off in WWF and Jarrett and everything. But, man, I mean, only his talent at being able to talk and to, and to get over on the mic – are you able to use an angle like this? Something silly is every week he's trying to put somebody else's hair on the line and people are actually buying it and actually coming out to see it because that's why I want to show that clip. Because as I explained that, I'm sure somebody's list is going, well, shit, that's why would anybody care about yeah. that? But he has a way of, you know, getting over on the microphone and in the end, but it makes Jarrett look so silly because Jarrett's just like, no dice, not happening. And then by the end of it, he's agreeing to exactly what he said in the beginning. He absolutely right. would not agree to. Uh, but somehow you uh, somehow you get it because Brian just kept pushing and pushing until he got his way. And we've all dealt with that person, right? The ones like, oh, let me try this. Let me try, you know, that that salesman, that person that really can sell something to the point where you're like, if you'll just shut up, <laughs> I will give this a shot. And then, yeah, I mean, uh, but like you said, Brian was, you know, I, I knew Brian really well. And I remember uh, begging him one time at his house because we were doing a show. Uh, I can't remember where it was. We were doing a show, and he was teasing the fact that he was going to wear his old, uh, too sexy Brian Christopher Memphis gear, and I was begging him because that was the time he was wearing the Grandmaster Six A yeah. jeans and stuff. And I remember just begging him because I'm like, dude, you don't realize how over that was with guys my age in Memphis. Like we would kill to see you back in like the old, you know, Brian Christopher gear from Memphis. But uh, but like you said, um, I don't know if if he understood, I think he did understand like how over he was with that gimmick here in Memphis, but uh, it was just, it was so serious and so intense that you, it was believable. He wasn't the dancing guy. He was very passionate about what he said. Just kind of like what we said about Danny earlier, when he said something, he could either make you believe it as a baby or he could totally just make you want to punch him in the face as a heel. Well, Brian, he, he believed yeah. what he was saying. He had that look and I mean, you, 
you know, Gene, you can look in a guy's eyes and tell if he believes what he's talking about or not. It translates when they're doing promos. And every single time, Brian, he just, he believed it. You could tell he believed it. He was totally immersed in that, that persona. And for people who didn't know any better, who just assumed like, oh, he's Jerry Lawler's kid. That's how he got. Like, if you go back and watch this and you listen to, you know, interviews over the years with Jerry Lawler, he got into wrestling in Memphis and got over in spite of being Jerry Lawler's kid. Like, Jerry Lawler didn't want him in the business. He did not help him get into the business. I mean, once he got in, he saw he was talented and he could do it. And he, he went along with it to a degree. But, you know, Brian, I mean, from wrestling in his backyard with, you know, his brother and, you know, Tony Williams and all them guys to where he got. He did that on his own. He was a super talented guy. He was really smart. He understood the business. He knew how to, he knew, understood psychology. And uh, if, if, you know, people don't get anything else out of this podcast, I really hope people get an appreciation for how good of a worker Brian was and how good of a heel he was. And he wasn't just Jerry Lawler's kid. And he wasn't just Grandmaster Sex A doing a silly dance. Uh, yeah. He had a lot more to offer to business. And I wish he'd had a chance for more people to have, have seen that. So just I'm, to I'm add in that opportunity to shine a light on that. Yeah. Just to add in what you were saying, he told us a story. We had him on our podcast back when we first started. Uh, I think it's like episode like 16 or something. Mm-hmm. So it's way back there. Um, and he told us that when he started out in the business, he showed up in a mask. Only like one or two people knew who he was. He put the mask on and he never took it off. Like only a few people knew who he was under that mask. He said he remembered uh, Bill coming up to him and going, what are you, some kind of Mexican shooter under there, brother? Because he wouldn't take the mask off and he wouldn't say anything to give up his identity. Yeah. And even in Lawler's book, he talked about how he didn't even know Brian was even interested in getting in the business. So he, he really did do it on his own. Absolutely. Yeah, I just I just went back and re- I'd seen it years ago, but I just went back recently kind of preparing for this podcast and was rewatching some shoot interviews with people. And I rewatched Lawler's and, you know, he talked, you know, quite a bit about, you know, Brian and how he got into business and kind of got in it around him, you know, <laughs> uh, but certainly not because of him. Uh, yeah. But anyway, speaking of the king, um, now the king comes out and he's going to tell us his version of the New Year's Eve party story. However, in his version, it wasn't actually New Year's Eve. It was the day after, <laughs> which totally kills Miller's whole, I rang in the New Year flat on my back. Why were they even at the same party? But, you know, Waller just had to point out that he actually spent New Year's Eve having fun with real friends, which had to be a slap in the face to whoever's party this was. <laughs> right. You know, if it actually had been a party. Uh, <laughs> But, uh, you know, again, pointing this aspect out kind of to me takes away from the whole point of this whole thing. I don't really get that. But uh, but anyway, uh, but otherwise, it's kind of more or less the same story that Dave Brown told us. Um, and again, you know, I know this was going along with Memphis's credo of personal issues draw money. But this might have been a stretch to me as far as trying to find a way to like – Hey, looking around the dressing room, we need to get Lawler and Miller together. How can we do that? And somebody's like, oh, so they're going to fight at the New Year's Eve party. And, uh, whew, I don't know, man. It's, it's just, it's, it's reaching. Um, yeah. I think you could have got there a better way, but I mean, I don't know. How do you guys feel about this well, New Year's not- Eve party that apparently wasn't a New Year's <laughs> Eve party angle? I, I really, you know, just thinking back, I was into it, man, because. You know, a lot of Memphis's stuff that they would present, it would be a stretch. You'd like, why does the, you know, Bill care about this guy, you know, talking to this guy this way? Like, why is he blowing up this, to this extent because of this? But, yeah, I mean, like, in real life, we would hear our parents, we would hear our, you know, anybody talking about real life situations like this. And it was almost like it was it was really, really, really believable because, you know, we had family members acting that way and stuff like that happening. You know, you had family members getting punched out drunk by Jerry Lawler. I'm saying at parties, there were (laughs) situations, somebody get their ass kicked, whatever, you know, it's relatable. And I think the biggest thing about this angle too, it was like one, it's like Mike Miller and Lawler. You don't really see those two on a card against each other. So it's kind of believable. And on the second side of this is like, not everything happens on camera. 
You know what I mean? Yeah. Like there are things that you hear about and it's like third party, you know, every fight that you heard about growing up as a kid, it wasn't like you were there witnessing everything that happened. You just heard, Oh, so-and-so's mad at so-and-so and they're going to the ballpark and fighting after school. And you would go just because you heard the buildup. You didn't have to see it. Yeah. I mean, I think you both make a great point. I do wish Lawler would have left it on New Year's Eve. I don't really know why we <laughs> needed that little detail thrown out right. there. They kind of threw a monkey wrench in all of it, in my opinion. But, uh, but yeah, you make, you make a good point. And my, I've always kind of wondered, you know, those marks on his face and the black eye and everything look kind of legit. I wonder if he actually had a wreck or something that week and they decided to spin it with this or, I mean, or he got hit in the match or how that played out or who knows, maybe this, maybe this was a real thing that happened. I don't know, but uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, it's interesting and we'll see how it plays out. But right now we're going to take our second uh, break of the show. Don't step away. <laughs> Listen to these words from our podcast for hey guys ray russell here curator of the wrestlecopia podcast network inviting you guys to listen to many of the programs here as part of the wrestlecopia brand including but not limited to the wrestling memory grenade currently covering the 1988 and the wwf project you can also listen to the Regional Wrestling Podcast, where we talk the territories, whether it's Jamie Ward with Georgia 81, Roman Gomez with the UWF in 1986, or Gene Jackson covering Memphis in 85. Three projects going on right now over there at Regional Wrestling. You can also listen to the Wrestling Stoop with the legend himself, Bob Roop. Bob goes back in time each and every week, covering not just his career, but countless stories and interactions with Hundreds of wrestling names spanning his two decades in the business. But that's not all. You can also check out the Puro Wrestling Academy with the professor of Puro Resu, Mr. Dan Ginnity. Dan and I go back in time and cover the history of Japanese professional wrestling in the English language. And you can listen to all of those shows and more, all part of the WrestleCopia Podcast Network, located over at WrestleCopia.com. That's WrestleCopia.com and anywhere your podcast streaming needs are met, from Apple to Spotify, Pocket Cast, and beyond. And while you're at it, why not subscribe to our social media guys for all the latest goings on here at the WrestleCopia Podcast Network. Plus, I'm constantly adding old school video clips and pictures from throughout wrestling history, you can follow us over on X, formerly Twitter, at Wrestling Grenade. That's at R A S S L I N Grenade. Also, follow and like me, Facebook.com slash Wrestling Grenade. And why not subscribe to YouTube.com slash Wrestling Grenade? So, if you're looking to support that next up and coming podcast brand, please consider making it WrestleCopia. All right, guys, we're back, and yes, we are excited to be a part of the Russell Copia Podcast Network, and we appreciate Ray Russell and everything he does for us here. And as we return to the show, Mike Samples and Leslie Ballinger are out at the desk, and we're going to talk a little more about them in the upcoming weeks. But since this show is already kind of running long because of talking about last week, we're going to move through. Uh, Samples lets us know that Burt Prentice isn't here. He's off in Dallas handling some business of some sort. Samples is here to give us our weekly reminder that Miss Texas is actually a dude named Bubba Johnson. Uh, I, I guess no one forgot to tell him that personal issues draw money unless it's some ridiculous crap like someone uh, named Miss Texas. There's someone like Miss Texas would be named Bubba Johnson. But anyway, uh, they're out here to promote another tag team match coming up against Miss Texas and Eddie Marlin this Monday night. And, uh, so we've got that going for us this week. Another tag team match for those four. So we'll see how it plays out this time. Uh, last weekend, I mean, last week, Eddie Marlin and Miss Texas come out on the bad end of it. We'll see how it goes this week. Then on to the ring for the new USWA Tag Team Champions, the Bruce Brothers, Ron and Don Harris, taking on Ben Jordan and Mountain Man Miller. Uh, ben Jordan I'm familiar with. Uh, I've tried to do some research. I can't find much about Mountain, Mountain Man Miller uh, other than he apparently had a pig named Arnold. Um, <laughs> <laughs> wonder where he got that from. But anyway, um, you know, and I, I can't also have Miller confirm or, or not whether or not he's related to Mean Mike Miller. Uh, <laughs> and if, in fact, he was at the New Year's Eve slash New Year's Day after party. It was a hoedown. 
yeah, I'm involved in that whole controversy. Uh, if you know folks, please message us. And, and <laughs> uh, but anyway, this was basically just a assault disguised as a as a tag team match. As the Harris Twins just beat the piss out of these guys. Um, Mountain Man Miller got flung into the desk out there, and I could not believe like one of the Harrises gave Ben Jordan one of the just roughest looking power bombs I've ever seen, <laughs> and he kicked out. <laughs> <laughs> and as a result, we have yet our third disqualification of the day due to a run in because the Moon Dogs hit the ring. And uh, let's take a quick look at that. You know, I don't think there's any 10 referees that can send these guys out here. I, if he wants to send them out, let him do it. You want to go up and come? No, I don't. But he can send them. He doesn't qualify. I don't think I can qualify him if I were in. Everybody in the ring. Oh, oh wait a minute. Here come the Moon Dogs. The Richard Lee. Oh, 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 oh. Battle takes over the Harrison, I betcha. Moon Dogs in with a chair. A big piece of plywood. Richard Lee's got a chair folded up. He says, come on, my samples. You want some of me? Here it is. Moon Dogs. Throw the Harris Brothers over on the table. Continuing to work them over down here on the floor. You get in there and stop it. You're a team now, Harris brother. Wow. Can you think of a stiffer tag team match you could book than the Moon Dogs against the Bruce Brothers? <laughs> no, and, and you know I was watching this back this week and uh, looking at this, and I remember when we were like twelve years old, they had Memphis Wrestling come to like Northside High School here in Jackson. And I remember the Harris brothers came out there and they got in the ring and I went to yell, you guys suck. And I got to you and he, one of them looked at me. I don't know if it was Ron or Don. One of them looked at me and I could feel the piss start on all my legs, like going down my thighs and everything. It's like, dude, they were massive. They had that look like they did not care, you know. And then you got the, the moon dogs who have like I always wonders, like, how do these guys just function in normal life? Because as a kid, I just believe that's the way they were. You can't tell me they have a bank account or uh, or anything that's civilized. You know, they go, Richard Lee drops them off in the woods, throws some food on the ground, <laughs> and then travels back and grabs them. You know, he snares them in a trap and brings them back to Memphis. I, these guys weren't real. Like, I don't think I've ever seen them throw a, a real wrestling move in there. It was just always boards, chairs, and chains. So when I saw this, even now, I was getting fired up because I want to see that match. Like, I want to see how hard-hitting that match is. Yeah, the Bruce Brothers, man, they – I always thought that they were, like, the likely – like, the, the unlikely candidates to beat the Moondogs, you know? I mean, because, like, thinking back, the Moondogs, they went through everybody, it seemed, for 1992. I mean, wasn't they, like, the – uh it was Lawler and Jarrett versus the Moon Dogs. That was the number one feud for '92 in PWI. I think it was like it was heated. And then you know, I didn't really know who the Harris Brothers were really before uh, Memphis. I mean, so it was like these big guys. Don't get me wrong, but you know, watching Memphis growing up, and that was our main thing. Like the Moon Dogs, they were almost unbeatable because the King and Jeff Jarrett could barely beat them. You yeah. know. We you know it started out Jarrett and Robert Fuller against the Moon Dogs, and they took out Fuller, and then Jarrett stepped—I mean uh, Lawler stepped in to that. Feud. Right. And like you said, they ended up with Feud of the Year, and my gosh, they fought all over the territory for over a year, and they replicated some of those uh, concession stand brawls on a couple of different occasions. And yeah, the Moon Dogs had just been staples of the Memphis territory mm -hmm. for, for years and years and years. Um, and of course, you know, you always Larry Latham, Moon Dog Spot was the the, the staple, and then you, you rotated out your other Moondog. At this point, we're talking Moondog Spike, which was Bill Smithson. But at different points, you had Randy Colley, which was Rex, and then you had, you know, Moondog Cujo, uh, who it, I think was, he had been in as uh, Ox Harley, and he had two or three different names and gimmicks. And uh, I know I was shocked as a kid to find out that Moondog Spot had once been 
Larry Latham of the Blonde Bombers teaming with Wayne Ferris back in the right. day and was actually a civilized human being at one point. <laughs> you know, having grown up watching Moondog Spot all those years, that was pretty crazy. Uh, but yeah, you know, they get out here and they, they, they basically run the Bruise Brothers out of the studio. And, you know, you mentioned uh, you didn't, you weren't really familiar with the Bruise Brothers before now. I remember as a kid, uh, the Bruise Brothers showing up as Ron and Don Bruise in like 88. Uh, and they looked like two Brian Lees of the time. And this ain't, I ain't talking about roughneck Undertaker Brian Lee. I'm talking about the original long blonde hair mullet Brian Lee. So at one point they teamed together and it was like three of them almost. It was like triplets <laughs> the twins. Uh, and then they disappear for a while and they show back up looking like this. Like, like well, they just go live in a biker bar for six years and then they turn <laughs> back up and, you know, they got tattoos and they it's like they grew a foot taller almost. And uh, and now they're fighting the moon dogs and I'm believing it, you know. And so after that, after they ran the uh, Bruce Brothers out of the studio, Richard Lee cuts a, a baby face promo. Uh, thankfully, he didn't have his guitar with him. He didn't try to sing like he did the previous week. Uh, but this was kind of unique in itself here in this whole scenario because it's like the Moondogs as the baby faces, and especially Richard Lee out there cutting baby face promos on behalf of the Moondogs. But that was another Memphis staple, too, is, you know, most guys who got over as the biggest heels, if they hung around long enough or they came back, could be some of the most over baby faces because somewhere along the way they earned the fans respect and the fans knew like, and they ain't about that bullshit. Like, you know, we need to go see them because yeah, these Harris brothers are bad, but they can handle the moon dog, you know? So, uh, it works. I mean, if you're told you know, a year before when the feud with Lawler and Jared, was like, you know, them guys are going to be good guys in six months. Like, Get out of here. There ain't no way, but. It's happening, it's working, and uh, they're feuding over the tag titles. And so uh, they're going to be squaring off again Monday night. We'll get to that here in a, here in a moment. Uh, but first, after Richard Lee cuts his promo, uh, Eddie Marlin came out. And he had something to say. And, well, let's just let Eddie tell you himself. All right, check this out. I can't see myself hitting you with this fist. But let me tell you something, young lady. I'll call you a lady whether you are or not. If you lay one hand on me, if you're in the ring when I'm in there, I won't hit you with my fist, but I hope you took a good look at Zeke Rivers because I'll snatch every bit of that red hair, uh, hair out of your head and your head will look like his, and then I'll turn you over my knee and I'll spank you, little girl, just like your mother and daddy should have done years ago. Now, I said I wouldn't hit a lady, but I will definitely pull that hair out, and I will definitely spank her. <laughs> Speaking of things that don't age well. <laughs> wow. I love that. Eddie Marlin, who's teaming with that man, Bubba Johnson. <laughs> he won't punch a woman. He's better than that, but he will snatch her balls and he will spank her and he will pull that hair. That's, that's the old Southern mentality though. My grandmother, uh, she used to have this thing she would tell us and she always dipped a snuff. So she always talked like this by here, but she always had snuff in her mouth and she would just tell us, say, Richard Lee, my middle name's Lee, by the way, I was going to say, I always got crap from my uncles because they would, I hated Richard Lee so much. And they would call me that <laughs> I hate, not, I'm not run the moon dogs, but she'd say, Richard Lee, I'm going to tell you something. Ain't nothing sorrier than when a man puts his hands on a woman. But when a woman puts her hands on a man, she has put her place, put herself in the place of a man and she should be treated as such. <laughs> and wow, I was like, my grandma. My grandmother's telling me to beat up a woman if she hits me. Like, this is the weirdest thing ever, but that's that Southern mentality. It's like, I'm not going to hit you, but if you hit me, you're now a man. <laughs> me and my little brother got into an argument with our, with our parents at the dinner table one time because my dad's like, you never hit a woman. And I go, unless they hit you first. And my brother's like, yeah. He's like, no, no matter what. <laughs> you never hit a woman. And my brother goes, unless they hit you first. <laughs> no. And we went back and forth like that for a half hour almost. <laughs> but I've always been in that mentality. Like, I don't believe in hitting a woman, but I believe if a woman's dumb enough to hit you, very good. What if she's got a gun on you or something? Another, you know? yeah, 
that's another podcast. It can't hit you. <laughs> yeah. We won't go down that rabbit hole. Um, <laughs> so I'm not sure if this next match was supposed to be a scheduled match or if this was just a coincidental brawl as the Masters of Terror came to the ring, which brought out Danny Davis and Bill Dundee, who was sporting a neck brace. I mean, uh, <laughs> neck brace? Towel around his neck. <laughs> got a little neck brace. Uh, <laughs> I mean, did they not know they were doing this angle that yeah. somebody didn't have the wherewithal to run by CVS? I'm like, hey, why don't you grab one of them $10 collars? That, even uh, even like a neck pillow. No, bro, they don't use a towel. <laughs> like one of those <laughs> airport neck pillows things. I'll grab a, t- I'll grab a towel from the day's <laughs> end. <laughs> so they, they, they fought in and out of the ring for uh, for a few minutes uh, to give us a sample of what to expect this Monday night. And uh, in case we didn't know, because, I mean, this these two teams have only been feuding for like 19 weeks, it seems like. <laughs> I mean, we recapped last week, but the reason they had to have the Oriental death match is because they had been feuding every week for I don't know how long. Uh, but they decided to pull one more out for uh, Dundee's last hoorah. And so uh, they brawled all around the studio. And, uh, and then Bill cuts a promo for us. So let's listen to what Bill has to say, and then uh, we'll kind of discuss – the fact that, as far as everyone in the other towns know, Bill Dundee has been taken out. He was laying in the floor back there dying, according to Danny Davis, and we had seen the last of him. But now, for us in Memphis that see the rest of the show, well, this is what we see. Dave, well, I was a little surprised to see you, but you handled yourself well. Well, thank you, Dave. Come Monday night, boys. I'm going to get real early at that Coliseum, and I'm going to be real nice to all them nice fans that come down to say goodbye to Bill Dundee. But when that bell rings, you sure as hell, I'm going to get mad. And if you bastards of terror think you're going to put me out and make a fool of me on my farewell deal, you're wrong, brother. Monday night, I'm climbing into the ring for the last time. And I'm retiring. And if I go out and you do with it, and Daddy David's got something to do with it, you boys are going to be retiring because you're going to be hurt, brother. And we're going to jerk their mask off or try because I believe you're ugly sin underneath that. But that's neither here nor there. Counting one, two, three don't mean nothing. We're coming to hurt you. And like I said, Monday night's the last time I'm walking into that, down that aisle and climbing into that ring. And it's to beat you two punks up. And Mike Samples, you're going to get a little of it too. Dave Brown, it's been nice. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Good luck. <laughs> I love that he gets this fired up promo. <laughs> <laughs> but he still takes a moment to shake Dave Brown's hand and thank yeah. <laughs> It's like, what do we have in here that looks like a neck brace? Give me that Walmart sack over there. I'll put it around my neck. It works just as well, honestly. But that's not my favorite part of the promo, honestly. The 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 handshake is the end. My favorite yeah. part of that promo is while Dundee is yelling and screaming, Danny Davis is over there miming pile drivers <laughs> and wrestling holds. <laughs> it was like he was translating for the deaf if he didn't know how to do it. Sign language was just like. Yeah. Maybe he thought it was a training exercise where it was like, you say the move and I have to act and it I'll out. Like, demonstrate. Yeah. What does it look like? Power driver, power driver, power driver. Yeah, right here. <laughs> Only enough Josh mic like, time. He's like, you come be my cheerleader, brother. Like, cool. Josh is like, Uncle Danny's never coming on here. Y'all have made fun of him more than you have anybody else. On this <laughs> yeah. Uh, it would have been hilarious if Bill would have been like, if you would have been sleeping with the little brother, I never would have caught that third one. <laughs> I think I'll have a few vertebrae, brother. Damn it, Danny. You're never getting hired by WCW as long as I'm an executive. Right. <laughs> so, all right. So, that closes out the show there. That was, I guess, our main event match of the night, even though. So, to recap, we've had, was it four, five matches today? Jeff Jarrett pinned the bounty hunter after a DDT, and everything else was either a run-in disqualification or never really got started because that match was just a brawl from the word go. Uh, but let's let Dave Brown quickly run down the card for Monday night and let us know what this has all been building up to because we all know that Saturday morning wrestling is just a commercial for Monday night. It's just a way to get us down there to see this. So let's see what we've been building to. See him 7.30 is when it all begins. First main event of the night, Burt Prentice and Leslie Bellinger in a regular tag team match against Eddie Marlin and Ms. Texas. Eddie Marlin's told you what he has in store for Leslie Bellinger if uh, she doesn't behave herself. Then the second match of the night, uh, Bill Dundee's farewell match, and this one uh, now will be as it uh, is booked. It stands. Bill Dundee and Danny Davis going against the Masters of Terror. Following that, you've got a 10-round boxing match. Jerry Lawler going against Mike Samples. Lawler says samples cost him $10,000 by hitting him from behind. 
and he's going to get even in the boxing match. Jeff Jarrett against Brian Christopher. Not exactly what Jeff wanted, but close to it, maybe. As Brian Christopher says this week, he's going to put Mr. Clyde's hair on the line and $2,000 against the title of Jeff Jarrett. And if Jeff can beat him this week for the second time in a row, then next week, he says, I'll put my hair on the line against that belt. That's what Jeff is looking for. Can he beat him Monday night to take it to the hair versus title match with Christopher's hair at stake a week from now? Then, the big main event of the night in which the Moondog Lumberjack tag title match will occur. The Lumberjacks will be stationed around the ring with folding metal chairs. Steel chairs in their hands. That's why they call it a Moondog Lumberjack match. It will be a tag title match as the new champions, the Bruise Brothers, Ron and Don Harris, with Mike Samples in their corner, will be defending against the Moon Dogs and Richard Lee. And from indications here today in the studio, I got to tell you, the Moon Dogs and Richard Lee are mighty upset about losing the belts and are looking to take them back to Monday night at the Mid South Coliseum. All right, guys. So. We've watched this episode, so every episode we're going to end this where I'm going to ask you guys three questions before we go take a look at what happened Monday night. So my first question I pose to both of you is, what is your least favorite part of today's episode? I would have to say you touched on it just not having a finish to most of the matches. Um, that, and I just didn't care that much about Mike Miller's face, you know, um, <laughs> and how that, that, you know, as a kid, I would never have believed that anything between Mike Miller and Lawler what it drew, you know, like yeah. it wasn't really inspiring to me, but yeah, I think as a kid, I also wanted to see matches in the right way and having DQs and run-ins. That was probably my least favorite part of the show. Josh, I guess, I mean, it's not that I just disliked this, but it seemed like everything else overshadowed it. I guess it was, I mean, that quick thing with the Harris brothers and the Moon Dogs, it was just like, you know, the Harris beat up uh, Ben Jordan and uh, the other Miller guy, Man Mountain Mike Miller, and, my and <laughs> beat him out of his shoes. And, <laughs> and, you know, that they, they was really quick. Then the Moon Dogs come out, and that was really quick. Richard Lee does a quick promo, and the whole thing is probably less than five minutes. And it's just like, to me, that makes it seem, I guess, a little unimportant. But given the time, I think they could have built it up. But just with everything else that's happened and everything, you know, I just, that's my least favorite. All right. So on the opposite end of that spectrum, what was your most favorite part of the show? Lawler and Mike Miller. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> I mean, I love the realness of it. I've said it before, but that's. That's what I fell in love with again. I mean, I've seen this when it happened, but rewatching it, I'm like, man, they didn't have anything going before, but this is serious. Like, this is a real life deal. Lawler, you know, was at a party. Oh my God. And then they jumped him here. Maybe some more of this stuff could happen. You know, I mean, like it really, really, really drew me in back then. And even now, I mean, cause I can't remember what happens next week and I, I really want to know. And, uh, honorable mention would be Eddie Marlin, dude. He was hilarious, super hilarious. Yeah, at one point, he just come out and said, "Match is booked," and walked off. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, it I'm, not, I'm not gonna hit you, but I'm gonna pull you by the head and I'm gonna give you spanking. Yep. I love it. And then he recapped it. He's like, I, I, just, "I won't hit you. I will. I will pull your hair. And I will spank you." Because the first time sounded like a threat. The second time, I'll sound like so. You know, if you want to hang out, after, <laughs> yeah. I will. I won't. Punch, I won't hit you, but I, I will pull your hair and I will spank you. You so were clear, and it, and it can get rough if you want. But, uh, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so I guess, I guess, in some ways, you just answered this, Josh, and, and Richard kind of answered it earlier in the show. But we're gonna ask it every time. So if this was, if if we were in 1993 right now, and you're in reasonable driving distance, would today's TV show alone uh, have inspired you to go buy a ticket to Monday night's event? I would went just just for the fact that it was Bill Dundee's last time being there and i know this might be it this is the last time i'm going to get to see superstar in action um i would have went and then i would want to see that moon dog match and i would have wanted to see if mr clyde got shaved bald like i knew he would you know but yeah. in my mind i would be like yeah i want to see what happens i want to see what mr clyde looks like bald because i'm a sucker for the sh head shaving gimmicks uh, but yeah dundee would be the the drawing factor there for me 
that's that's my answer too. I mean, like the thing with Uncle Danny and, and Bill Dundee and the Masters of Terror is so intense, and you know the Masters of Terror is going to get their ass whipped. It's just how bad. And you figure the Oriental Deathmatch didn't do it. And then they tried, they're trying to make Bill Dundee roll up to his desk in WCW, not walk up to it. No. So, I mean, it's that that's white hot right there. I, I just, that I would want to go just for that one match. That's a fun thing about Memphis that they did a lot over the years that they would have something you think this is absolutely positively got to be the blow off match, such as the Oriental Deathmatch. And then the next week they find a way. To make you come see it again, they 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 double down, and now it's like Bill Dundee's last match ever. Holy cow! I've got to see this. You know yeah. where you never would have thought you'd have went and paid to see that same match again, but now it's got a whole another element to it. Now it's a whole different ball game. So uh, before we can head to the the Mid South Coliseum on Monday night, though, guys, we got to leave the TV Five Studio. We got to drive over to Nashville to the fairgrounds because we got a show tonight. All right, so. Spoiler alert, some of this may sound a little bit familiar. The results are as follows. Leslie Ballinger and Mike Sample beat Miss Texas and Eddie Marlin. Bill Dundee and Danny Davis beat Masters of Terror in an Oriental Deathmatch. <laughs> Ron and Don Harris won the USWA tag titles that he just had on Memphis TV from the Moondog Spot and Spike. Uh, Southern title versus the valet's hair, Jeff Jarrett versus Brian Christopher. Now, I don't know how this plays out. You already shaved. (laughs) (laughs) I don't know. Dramatically snatch it off. I I would love to know how that works. Uh, And then in the uh, USWA title versus the mask, somehow, someway, Jerry the King Lawler beat the Christmas creature, and once again, it was Glenn Jacobs again. Uh, and then in the main event, he uh, pulled it off one more time. Moondog Spike won the Moondog Battle Royal. So now we are ready to make a trip down to the Mid-South Coliseum. Now, you guys remember that last week I told you that card that we discussed, headlined by Jerry Lawler versus the Christmas Creature, uh, headlined by the Moondogs and uh, the, the Bruce Brothers, the Oriental Death match, hair versus title. Uh, that match drew, I mean, that card drew 3,500 people. All right. January 4th, 1993, Mid South Coliseum, Memphis, Tennessee, drawing a crowd of 1,000 people. Burt Prentice and Leslie Ballinger beat Eddie Marlin and Miss Texas. The Masters of Terror beat Bill Dundee and Danny Davis when they pinned Bill Dundee. Did the right thing on the way out. Kudos, superstar. Mm-hmm. In a match, Jerry Lawler beat Mike Samples via DQ in a boxing match. Maybe he fell out of the ring. Yeah. Uh, USWA Southern Championship versus Mr. Clyde's hair in $2,000 cash. Yeah. Jeff Jarrett beat Brian Christopher, and Mr. <laughs> Clyde had his head shaved, and Jarrett collected oh, no. $2,000 cash. And then... In a lumberjack chair match where all the lumberjacks around ringside had chairs in their hand, Ron and Don Harris, the Brewers brothers, went to a double disqualification with the Moondog spot and spike. How the <laughs> F do you get a double DQ in a lumberjack chair match? <laughs> Only in Memphis. Yeah. And then, after we had that in the semi main event, in the main event where Jerry the King Lawler faced me, Mike Miller. Does anybody want to guess, take a wild guess at what you think the result of this match was? Gosh. Oh, Mike Miller's going over. It's a surprise, right? I would thought I thought Lawler just beat him quickly. I was just making a oh. joke. <laughs> Double freaking disqualification. <laughs> no. <laughs> We're gonna go another week with Mike Miller's face. We dropped twenty five hundred people from last <laughs> week's show. And so we give them a DQ in the boxing match. We give them a double DQ in the tag title match. We give them a double DQ in the main event. I'm bum fuzzled. And, 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 and over on uh, the regional wrestling podcast where me and Ray Russell has been reviewing uh, Memphis 1985, man, we've been reviewing cards where it's just DQ after DQ. 
uh, matches with crazy stipulations. Like they had a Texas death match and then a disqualification. It's like, how? <laughs> so uh, again, we're not here to, uh, to insult Memphis wrestling. We love it, but that's a head scratcher guys. Like yeah. I would have thought you'd need to do something hot to try to get that crowd back. So uh, we dropped from 3,500 down to a thousand. That's, that is assuming these these uh, attendances are accurate that I'm getting online. Uh, some of them are from the uh, Observer, and some of them are just from random websites. But I assume they got them from the Observer at some point. Um, so we will see what the next show draws coming out of this. Uh, yeah. I would be inter- I would be interested to see what the next show draws because looking at it, you know, this show was the first one after Christmas, like the first one after that Christmas crunch. And knowing the South, how they are, you know, everybody's broke right after Christmas. So I'm wondering if that played any into this equation, or maybe they just weren't that keen on seeing what happened to Mike Miller's face. Well, because I'm going to say, let's be honest. I mean, you guys Mm. were were, uh, very complimentary of the Mike Miller angle as far as putting over that the reason for doing it is is something that's relatable, and that's all true. But the fact of the matter is, and especially if you're going back in time looking now, this Christmas creature thing had played out over a period of weeks. So that was technically kind of a blow off title versus the mask. You had what you assumed was the blow off with the nightmares, the mat or not the nightmares, Dundee and Danny Davis against the masters of terror and this Oriental death match. You had this big tag title match with the moon dogs. All this was kind of a building with, and the hair match with Jared and Brian Christopher. So I could see where that would draw big. And then, like you said, we're, we're coming so this is January the 4th. So this is week after Christmas, week after New Year's. Uh, Mike Miller is not a guy who's been heavily figured in and or off the top of the cards at all in recent weeks in, in the USWA. Um, so I got to think they probably didn't expect big things out of this card. This is kind of more of a placeholder card. Um, but... I would have thought for the same reason that both of you guys said that you would have came to the show and I felt the same way. I would have thought more people would have turned out to see Bill Dundee's last match. I don't think that they, I don't think that they played that card hard enough on TV. I mean, yeah, they mentioned a couple of times and everything and they had to kind of dance around it for the other towns and all that. But uh, I really think they should have doubled down on that and really pushed that harder. Uh, and really drove home like, hey, this is your last chance to see Bill Dundee in Memphis, and he's been a huge part of this. Um, because, you know, if I'm Dundee, I'm probably leaving the Coliseum that night going, good riddance, I'm heading to Atlanta, and y'all can all just suck it because, you know, a thousand people showed up. Which, I mean, don't get me wrong, like these days, a thousand people shows up anywhere. I mean, it's calls for celebration. We're, we're you know, high fives all around. But after you just had 3,500 and you only drew a thousand, I'm sure Dundee was like, screw this i'm out of here you know but uh do you you think them playing with that hokey pokey like dundee's not going to be here he is going to be here do you think some people might have just turned the tv off before the end and not just just thought dundee wasn't going to be there you know back to what i said earlier in the show in 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 93 we're still a little more kayfabe the internet isn't prominent now not as many people are as smart then as they are now um, and you've been taught in Memphis, the pile driver is death, you know, and you just watched Bill Dundee get pile driven on the floor three times, whether you thought the first two looked legitimate or not, whatever, but you see Bill Dundee get pile driven on the floor three times. And then he comes back out at the end of the show with a towel around his neck and has a fight. I mean, I thought that was a bad call. Yeah. Maybe limp out there and be like, you know, Against doctor's orders, I'm going to try to be there Monday night. But to have a studio brawl in the same show that you got, it's almost kind of like when they had to let Lawler come out after getting hit by the car because all the yeah. people were calling the cops, so they had to let him free. <laughs> but it killed, you know, it killed the the draw for Monday night. I think that probably hurt him here. I think a lot of people were like, "Oh my God, Dundee just got you know pile driven three times on the floor. He's probably he's probably going to be able to go take that job in WCW. He's probably right. going to have to you know be in a." body cast the rest of his life and then he comes right. back out at the end of the show in this towel for a neck brace and now he's going to be there monday and we've already seen this match umpteen weeks in a row right uh, because that was the other thing too if you if you listen to those two cards i just read off 
pull the Christmas creature out of there. It was a rehash of the previous week. It was yeah. with Mike Miller plugged in for Glenn Jacobs <laughs> and a boxing match with Lawler and Mike Samples. And at that point, Mike Samples was just considered a manager for all yeah. intents and purposes. So, I mean, it was kind of a lackluster card because it was just kind of a, a show full of rematches. And the only real stakes, like you said, was really uh, Dundee's last match. But if you were kind of insulted by the fact that, like, they piled right this dude on the floor three times. He came back out, and now I'm going to go watch him have another match with these guys. And they had an Oriental death match last week. And, <laughs> and no one does. Um, I mean, that's the kind of things that they did in Memphis, I think, that kind of hurt them sometimes. But, again, this is, you know, looking back, you know, all these years later, it's easy to be critical of it. But uh, overall, it was a pretty good show. Uh, you know, when I first – was we were getting ready to start this podcast. I was figuring out where we were going to jump off at because I told you I was like 92, 93, I don't know. And I almost wanted to jump ahead in 93 to where the WWF guys started coming in because I, I just read on paper. I was like, ooh, the first episode builds to a Mike Miller main event. Like, <laughs> nobody's going to listen to this podcast. And then I watched it and I was like, eh, okay, we can at least make it entertaining talking about it. You know, yeah. I hope we have. And I hope everybody's enjoyed it. And, People join us, you know, for the next episode because um, it's going to get a lot more interesting from here, folks. Like, there's a lot of cool things that happen in, in USWA in 1993. And like I say, if, if we can keep this podcast going, I eventually want to circle back to 92 someday. But um, there's a lot of a lot of great stuff that goes on in 93, and there's stuff that I really want to get to in 94, 95, mm-hmm. and even 96. So uh, we're here for the long haul, folks. So uh, if you enjoyed the podcast. Please let us know if, if there's something you would like to see change or you'd like better. Let us know. You can go to our Facebook page, facebook.com slash retro wrestling review. Let us know what you think. You know, let us know what you would like to see us do different or do better. Give us your opinions. Give us your thoughts on the show. Would you have gone and seen the show? Did you enjoy it? What did you think of the Dundee angle? And of course, you can find this show and all sorts of great podcasts over at wrestlecopia.com. Go check out all the great podcasts that Ray Russell uh, has over there. And there's Morgan added daily. Dave Dynasty just recently joined the family over there. So a lot of good stuff coming up. And, of course, P3 Radio. Tell us uh, tell us a little bit about P3 Radio and where they can come hear you guys. I mean, you guys have been doing this for a long time. You just, just start doing this recently. <clears throat> yeah, man. We've been uh, going uh, going strong since 2017. Um, back then we started out as a – predominantly wrestling associated podcast and we would have other guests on too but now we're kind of just um comedy and um just different news stuff kind of poking fun at different things but uh we're always you know we welcome wrestlers to come on or whatever might have tried to get a few to promote this show but uh either way on twitter we're at p3 radio the number one on facebook search bar pop poncho p-o-n-c-h-o you'll see our photograph and you want to get with us the old school way 731-300-6675 yep and uh and if you're looking for us on uh, itunes or anywhere you find your podcast just remember it's p3 radio all one word like it's in our um descriptor right here right right here yeah you'll get it yeah you'll get it yes <laughs> yes check out their show it's a lot of fun i've been on there a few times and people who look and somewhat vaguely resemble me have been on there sometimes and uh it's a lot of fun i really enjoy it uh, these guys uh like i say they were top of my list uh to do this because i knew that not only uh are they knowledgeable at wrestling but they're also uh fun and entertaining guys and they're and they're not afraid to give their opinions you know they're not going to hold back but they're also not going to just shit on anything for yeah. the sake <laughs> but they're going to be honest and that's what we're here to do we're just gonna be honest we're not here to you know, we're not knocking anything. I mean, you know, we love this stuff, but this sometimes, man, it's a head scratcher. And just for me, uh, on a, on a show like that to, to end the close the night with back to back double disqualifications, <laughs> I'm still just kind of dumbfounded, but we're going to see how they come back for it on the next episode. So, uh, join us to see, uh, where the USWA goes next from here. And uh, we got a lot of fun stuff planned. We're working on getting some interviews together. We've had some USWA wrestlers from back in the day have already reached out and are showing interest in being involved. And something else we're looking at maybe doing at some point is maybe doing like some watch alongs where we actually have the actual episode uh, playing 
and uh, we'll talk over the actual episode if that's something you guys would be interested in, in seeing. Uh, let us know. Like I said, this is primarily the audience for WrestleCopia's audio. Uh, so, you know, we got to be able to do things that are good for audio. But, you know, I have all the shows available over on my YouTube channel, so we can make that happen. So we're just here to uh, to have some fun and uh, hopefully entertain and, and, and educate a little bit. Like I said, on the next moving forward, we're going to start digging a little deeper into some of these folks and telling you a little bit more about them. Uh, I didn't want to want to make this show last too too long so next week we're gonna dig a little bit into who is zeke rivers where did this guy come from <laughs> where do they find him who's mr clyde what other names does he wrestle as because spoiler alert he wasn't always mr clyde he's had a couple other aliases too we'll talk about mike samples and lauren davenport and leslie ballinger and all kinds of uh random uswa people who if you're not an old school uswa fan maybe you hadn't heard of these folks we're gonna tell you about them everybody else so uh I want to thank uh, my, my co-hosts, both Richard and Josh. You guys are awesome. You guys check out P3 Radio. It's a lot of fun. Thanks, everybody, for listening. Help us spread the word. Share it on Facebook, Twitter, X, whatever the hell it's called now. Get it out there for us. And uh, we will see you on the very next episode of the Wrestling Review Podcast. Mm-hmm.